on World News Tonight. Incursion confusion. US President Joe Biden backs down on rash claims from a prior meeting against Russia. Now the president is on damage control to defuse fresh tensions brought about by the statement. Backing the Uyghurs. France joins most of the world in handing China heavy criticism for its infamous human rights abuses against ethnic minorities. What repercussions await China? Find out tonight. Pills for all. The new COVID pills may not be an exclusive item in the coming months as the UN drafts a plan to provide pills to the penniless, focusing on developing countries which are struggling to cope with the virus. And colourful corals. A hidden beauty discovered off the coasts of Tahiti provide hope in the revival of Mother Nature's wonders. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight this Friday night. Today's broadcast begins with yet more tensions over Ukraine. The top diplomats of Russia and the United States were to meet in Switzerland to discuss soaring tensions over Ukraine after a flurry of meetings between officials on both sides in the last week produced no breakthroughs. The stakes are high for both Antony Blinken and Sergei Lavrov. Both men are in Geneva to find a diplomatic way out of the crisis that has led to soaring tensions between Russia and Western leaders. Moscow has sent thousands of soldiers to its border with Ukraine. Vladimir Putin has conditioned the withdrawal of troops on a guarantee that Ukraine will never join NATO. But he denies planning an invasion, a move that Joe Biden says would be a disaster. There could be no doubt at all that if Putin makes this choice, Russia will pay a heavy price. Is also not the only scenario we need to be prepared for. Russia has a long history of using measures other than overt military action to carry out aggression. The arrival of Russian troops in Belarus has only heightened tensions. Moscow has also announced large-scale naval operations in moves reminiscent of the Cold War. For its part, the U.S. has been trying to put on a united front with its Western allies, a stance that many observers say puts both sides at an impasse. Amid stalling diplomacy, Washington has approved sending $200 million in military aid to Ukraine. The U.S. has also cleared Baltic states to send American-made weaponry to Kiev to help bolster its defenses. The growing tensions along the Ukrainian border has everyone on edge. The statements released from the White House by the President of the United States, who used the term minor incursion in detailing the possible response plan, was not received well by the President of Ukraine. As such, this statement followed a series of clarifications and damage control from the United States so as to not contribute to the existing hostility. If any any assembled Russian units move across the Ukrainian border, that is an invasion. U.S. President Joe Biden on Thursday in damage control, one day after his remarks sparked some confusion and consternation among allies. At a news conference Wednesday, Biden seemed to suggest that a smaller-scale Russian military incursion into Ukraine might be met with a weaker U.S. response. Russia will be held accountable if it invades, and it depends on what it does. It's one thing if it's a minor incursion and then we end up having a fight about what to do and not do, etc. In a statement shortly after, White House Press Secretary Jan Psaki tried to clear things up. Quote, if any Russian military forces move across the Ukrainian border, that's a renewed invasion and it will be met with a swift, severe and united response from the United States and our allies. But that didn't soothe the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, who tweeted on Thursday morning, quote, we want to remind the great powers that there are no minor incursions and small nations, just as there are no minor casualties and little grief from the loss of loved ones. Biden on Wednesday said he expected Russian President Vladimir Putin to launch some kind of action against Ukraine, but said that the repercussions of a fresh invasion would be a disaster for Russia. My guess is he will move in. He has to do something. But Biden's minor incursion remark sent Western leaders scrambling to get behind a unified message. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met ministers from Britain, France, and Germany in Berlin on Thursday. If any Russian military forces move uh, across the Ukrainian border and uh, commit new acts of aggression against Ukraine, um, that will be met with a swift, severe, united response. 
Russia has massed tens of thousands of troops on its border with Ukraine, and Western states fear Moscow is planning a new assault on a country it invaded in 2014. Russia denies it is planning an attack, but says it could take unspecified military action if a list of demands are not met, including a promise from NATO never to admit Kiev as a member. Some officials privately express frustration at Biden's remarks, although they describe them as a gaffe, unlikely to alter Moscow's calculations. Still in the United States, the Capitol Riot Investigation Panel has requested testimony from Donald Trump's daughter, Ivanka Trump, regarding the conversations that took place moments before and possibly during the deadly riots that may have led to even more calamity in the nation. The January 6th committee formally requesting testimony from Ivanka Trump, a senior advisor to the former president who spent the day of the attack at the White House. The committee interested in a heated Oval Office phone call they say Ivanka overheard between her father and the vice president and in, quote, any other conversations you may have witnessed or participated in regarding the president's plan to obstruct or impede the counting of electoral votes. The committee particularly interested in one interaction. We have firsthand testimony uh, that his daughter Ivanka uh, went in at least twice uh, to ask him to please stop this violence. A spokesperson for Ivanka Trump says she publicly stated that day at 3.15 p.m., quote, any security breach or disrespect to our law enforcement is unacceptable. The violence must stop immediately. China's persecution of the ethnic minorities in the Xinjiang region has been heavily criticized by the international community and human rights activists. France has now joined its Western counterparts in openly condemning these actions by formally condemning China's treatment towards the Uyghur community as an act of genocide. A group of French MPs are hoping for a strong and historic decision Thursday when they vote on a text to label the treatment of Uyghur people in Xinjiang as genocide. The resolution, brought by the Socialist Party, denounces forced labor, torture, sexual violence and forced sterilization of the Muslim ethnic minority. These elements, now widely documented, testify to an intention to destroy Uyghur identity, community ties, affiliation possibilities and intergenerational ties, and more generally to destroy the Uyghurs, including biologically as a group in their own right. Several countries have already denounced genocide in Xinjiang, including the Netherlands, the Czech Republic, the US and UK. Human rights groups believe China has detained more than one million Uyghurs since 2017, putting them in what Beijing calls re-education camps. It's also believed the minority group is being forced into labor, notably cotton picking. China denies the allegations of crimes against humanity and maintains the camps serve to stop separatism. Xinjiang is situated in China's northwest and, like Tibet, is autonomous. Despite this, the regions are under major restrictions by the central government. About 12 million Uyghurs live in Xinjiang, making up less than half its population. We have some breaking news. Meat Loaf, the flamboyant U.S. rock star who rose to global fame with his debut Bat Out of Hell album, has died aged 74. The legendary star passed away tonight with his wife Deborah by his side. The singer and actor, otherwise known as Michael Leah Day, has career spanning six decades and sold more than 100 million albums worldwide. His hits included the near 10-minute long title track from Bat of Hell, Paradise by the Dashboard Light from the same album and I'd Do Anything for Love from the 1993 follow-up Bat Out of Hell 2, Back Into Hell. Born in Dallas, Texas in 1947, Meatloaf found success on the stage in the 1970s, performing in Broadway musicals Hair and the Rocky Horror Show. Meatloaf sang in Bat of Hell with an intensity bordering on melodrama that became his hallmark and established him as a rock icon. September 2017 was the last time North Korea engaged in a nuclear weapons test. But with the recent increase in weapons testing, ranging from train-based ballistic missiles to long-range cruise missiles to underwater missiles, it is evident that North Korean officials are expanding their arsenal. So it's no surprise that Pyongyang has come out with a statement that they are considering relaunching their nuclear weapons program as well. North Korea may resume tests of its nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles. State media said Thursday that Pyongyang was considering lifting a self-imposed suspension on those activities. 
Tension has been rising between the U.S. and North Korea in recent weeks over Pyongyang's unusually rapid series of short-range missile tests, conducting four so far this year. But North Korea has not tested its nuclear weapons or long-range missiles since 2017, as it started engaging in denuclearization talks with South Korea and the United States. Before that, it tested a missile capable of striking the U.S. mainland. However, Washington's push for fresh sanctions this month was called hostile by Pyongyang. Its powerful Politburo of the Workers' Party said the U.S. has reached a danger line, citing its continued joint drills with Seoul and its repeated calls for sanctions. The U.S. State Department and White House did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Pyongyang has defended the missile launches as its sovereign right to self-defense and accused Washington of applying double standards. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight and we now move on to the COVID updates around the globe. The COVID pandemic does not seem to be slowing down anytime soon, especially in Australia where the past few weeks have been recorded as the deadliest ones in the country. Most cases being caused due to the Omicron variant running rampant. Let's cross over to other than the World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip from Melbourne in Australia for more. Timothy? Yes, I'm Rodney. The last two weeks of the Omicron outbreak have been the deadliest of the entire coronavirus pandemic, with four of the five highest daily death tolls all in the past week alone. The data shows that for Australia's third large COVID wave, older Australians continue to be overrepresented in the death toll, even as young Australians record far more cases. And in New South Wales, where more detailed data is available, the protective effect of the vaccines remain clear with serious outcomes, deaths and ICU admission, far less likely for vaccinated people with COVID across every age group. There were over 1,600 deaths across Australia from the beginning of the pandemic up to when the first case of Omicron in Australia was announced. Since then, with a mix of the Delta and Omicron variants circulating over this time, there have been over 1,100 deaths. Meanwhile, despite the rising caseload, the Australian government has successfully supplied aid to disaster-stricken Tonga in the form of essential supplies, including water and other dry rations as well. Back to you, Adam. Thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. The Japanese government is placing Tokyo and a dozen more regions in the country under tougher COVID-19 curbs as Japan is experiencing a massive resurgence in new infections. These preemptive actions, although may seem inconvenient at the time, are aimed at getting the country through this new wave with minimum damage. Starting Friday, tighter rules known as quasi-emergency measures will be in place for about three weeks in 13 Japanese prefectures, including Tokyo. The decision comes as Omicron continues to drive record cases in the country. The government would like to place quasi-emergency measures in these 13 prefectures as urged by its local governors. Firstly, we believe local offices need to prepare further to be able to operate the medical system they've set up. Secondly, put in place robust measures to contain the rising number of cases. The new rules essentially allow each region to decide what measures to take but it's widely expected it will include limiting business hours at bars and restaurants. Infections are spreading fast in Japan, with 46,200 new cases reported on Thursday alone. Japan has been reporting fresh records for three straight days. On the same day, Tokyo also posted another record high of more than 8,600 new cases. While almost 80% of Japan's population is fully vaccinated, less than 2% have received a booster shot. In a bid to contain the virus, Japan has been suspending entry of all foreign visitors from late November last year. Many people have expressed discontent over this stringent virus measure, with some even asking Japan to stop xenophobia. The Japanese government, however, plans to keep the entry ban on non-resident foreigners until the end of February. 
The hope of herd immunity has begun to fade due to the rapidly spreading Omicron variant. At the outset, many European countries subscribed to the philosophy that herd immunity could provide a passage out of the pandemic. But the infectious nature of the Omicron variant has dismissed any such preconceptions. As Omicron spread quickly across the globe, some experts had hoped there could be a silver lining, that it would help finally deliver the promise of herd immunity against COVID-19. But herd immunity, in which enough people become immune to a virus through vaccination or infection, won't come with Omicron, experts now say, as the variant has proven even better than its predecessors at infecting people who were vaccinated or had a prior infection. Experts say Omicron has provided further evidence that the coronavirus will continue to find ways to break through our immune defenses. Instead of herd immunity, many experts said there was growing evidence that vaccines and prior infection would still provide the population some level of immunity, making the disease less serious for those who get infected or reinfected. And while hope for herd immunity is still hard for many to shake, Health experts say there's a future where COVID, while not eradicated, is more of a manageable challenge and less of a crisis. We have some good news for you. Merck's COVID pills may be all the rage in well-developed nations, but the countries on the poor end of the spectrum are struggling to get their hands on any of these precious medications. To solve this issue and possibly to bridge the vaccination gap globally, the United Nations have begun supplying a cheaper version of the pills to affected nations. Poorer countries will get access to a cheaper version of Merck's COVID pill. A UN-backed agency has struck a deal with nearly 30 drug makers to turn out the treatment at low cost. The Molnupiravir antiviral pill received emergency approval from the US in December. It reduces deaths and hospitalizations among high-risk patients by around 30%. But it costs around $700 per course, making it unaffordable for some countries. Now the New Deal should reduce that price to around $20 for 105 developing nations. Merck won't receive any royalties on the low-cost drugs as long as COVID remains classified as a public health emergency by the World Health Organization. There's no word yet on how many doses will be produced, but supply is expected to meet demand in the developing world. Besides the New Deal, Merck has also reached licensing agreements with eight Indian drug makers including Dr. Reddy's laboratories. A stampede at a church gathering in Liberia's capital Monrovia killed 29 people overnight. The incident occurred during an all-night Christian worship event at New Crew Town, a neighborhood on the outskirts of the capital. A, little boy exclaimed to me, a large rush of people at a church gathering in Liberia's capital Monrovia has left at least 29 people dead overnight into Thursday, according to authorities. Video showed discarded shoes scattered on the floor near the incident, around people mourning and wailing. One resident who attended the event told the crush began after a group of armed men rushed the crowd in an attempt to stage a robbery. Bands of Liberian street gangs known as Zogos commonly commit robberies with machetes and other small weapons. Police spokesman Moses Carter declined to comment on what caused the incident. He said an investigation is underway. The deputy information minister told state radio that the incident occurred during an all-night Christian worship event. President George Weyer visited the site on Thursday. He declared a three-day period of national mourning, and his office said the Liberian Red Cross and Disaster Management Agency had been called in to assist victims. A group of millionaires have said enough is enough to the idea of the rich getting even richer. Their solution being more mandatory taxes directed towards the group, as this faction of individuals continue to amass large quantities of wealth despite the toll the pandemic took on the rest of the world. Make us pay more tax. That was the message a group of billionaires and millionaires had for leaders convening virtually for the World Economic Forum. The group calls itself the Patriotic Millionaires and is made up of more than 100 ultra-wealthy individuals, including Disney heiress Abigail Disney. They say they should be forced to help pay for the pandemic response and tackle the gulf between rich and poor. In an open letter published on Wednesday, 
The group said, quote, While the world has gone through an immense amount of suffering in the last two years, we have actually seen our wealth rise. Yet few, if any of us, can honestly say that we pay our fair share in taxes. That sentiment was echoed by Oxfam, which on Monday published a report detailing how the super-rich have thrived during the health crisis. The charity details how the world's 10 wealthiest people more than doubled their fortunes to $1.5 trillion during the pandemic. Oxfam President and CEO, Abby Maxman. We've really had, during the pandemic, an inequality explosion. And it's been a period that has been an unprecedented boom for billionaires. 99% of humanity is being left behind. So as we've watched billionaire growth double at the rate of $15,000 per second, that's the same $80 less per second than a minimum wage worker makes in a year. The Patriotic Millionaires Group is calling for an annual wealth tax on those with fortunes of more than $5 million. They say that could raise more than $2.5 trillion and pull more than 2 billion people out of poverty. Last year, the World Bank urged countries to consider a wealth tax to help reduce inequality, replenish state coffers depleted by COVID-19 relief programmes and regain social trust. However, outside Argentina and Colombia, no new wealth tax schemes have been initiated since the start of the pandemic. Welcome back to World News Tonight. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A massive crater in the ground following an explosion in Ghana's rural western region killed an unknown number of nearby residents. The explosion happened in Apiache between the towns of Bogoso and Baudi when a truck carrying explosives to a gold mine collided with a motorcycle. A British-Belgian teenager became the youngest woman to fly solo around the globe and the first person to do so in a mitrolite plane after five months, five-continent odyssey into her sharp ultralight. 19-year-old Zara Rutherford landed back at an airport in Belgium after flying 51,000 kilometers. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other there in English. We're leaving you tonight with spectacular visuals of a pristine coral reef recently discovered off Tahiti that is abundant with marine life. Thank you for joining us. Good night.